Hey, Annika. How you doing? Hey, Brad. Good. How are you? Good, thanks. Good. Um, will my Prezo automatically be on here or do, do I need to share my screen? Um, I think you'll need to share your screen if that's if that's all right. Yeah, no dramas. Cool. Thank you. Hi, hey, Brad. Hey, yeah, everybody. I feel like I'm on the <sighs> Yeah. Uh, no, I just got home. <laughs> yeah. I'll get changed. Um, Annika, how do I... Uh, we use Microsoft Teams where I work, how do I share my screen? Um, so it'll be- oh, at, Actually, I see it in green down the bottom. Yes, Sorry. that's good, yeah. <laughs> All right. I am the same, Alex. I, like, you jump in between Google Hangouts and yeah. Teams and Zoom and, 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 and some of them are on the phone and some of them are on a laptop and some of them are on a PC. And it just like, makes my head spin. Yeah, the new world, mate. Yeah. <laughs> You're in Sydney, Alex? Sure am, yeah. Where um, I'm actually just at home at the moment, which is also in the city, but it's um, just the in Martin Place is the office. Yeah. Yeah, it's so nice and close. We've had a couple of people from Rudy and Lawyers on the podcast over the years. Yeah, uh, Georgina was telling me that. Yeah. I think she was on somewhat recently, a few months ago, maybe. Well, I look after a few podcasts for different clients, so it is, it's hard to keep it in my head. Sure. <laughs> Sometimes I think, oh, I had that person on like only a couple of months ago, and I look at my list and I was like, oh, that was like episode 40. That was about four years ago. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> So we'll give people a couple of minutes to just log on and get settled in and all that sort of stuff. Brooke's got a better offer, Brad. What's that? I said Brooke's got a better offer. <laughs> oh, yeah. Her grandfather passed away in the UK, so oh. she jumped on a flight to Savo. Oh. Yeah, so she flew out at four. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, she's got two weeks away, so I, at some point it'll be a better offer, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I, I remember that it's, it, I've written it down, where have I written it down? Because I remember that it's, you don't pronounce her last name f phonetically, i.e. how, it, like, it's not VC, is it? Yeah, it is. It is VC, yeah. yeah. So, I met, so I rang the pharmacy yesterday to just double check how to pronounce it. And then, I, oh yeah, I can see my note here, but yeah, so that's you might, unfortunate. Might need to. Yeah, I'll get out of that. Yeah. yeah, I won't, I won't trouble you too much, mate. <laughs> no, you're an old hand at all this sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I can't avoid, I can't avoid you, whether it's live panels, podcasts, webinars. I might as well just come in and see you at the pharmacy. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to, mate. Just catch us on here. Yeah. <laughs> mate, that's quite the man cave you've got there. I was going to say that. <laughs> yeah, so this, there's a, there's a, the study extends probably, oh, probably another hundred and fifty percent that way, and so I've got like it's one big room, but I've got like I put bookshelves in the middle so that it creates two sort of separate spaces. But because I work at home normally, I put in a bit of effort to make sure I've got some, you know, I've got good desk and I've got a little lounge here and all the things that I'd never hung up that I had to dig out of the cupboard. This one's the best one. We'll start in a second, but this one is the best one. So. For those participants on the podcast who aren't in Canberra, there's a thing called Mr. Fluffy, which was asbestos being put in uh, insulation in houses, uh, probably in the 70s or something. And so the government ran a compulsory, compulsorily, a compulsory buyback 
scheme where they had to buy your house, they'd knock it down, dispose of the asbestos. You could buy the land back, all that sort of stuff, build if you wanted to. But my parents just up and moved. They had a Mr. Fluffy house. And my dad found that in the cupboard, and it is from the Seaford in Victoria. The Seaford Under 11s Second Division Premiers. And it's got all our names written on it. And uh, he said, do you remember that? I said, I don't remember anything about that season. I don't even remember winning the comp. But I thought, well, I can't just stick it in a plastic bag. So I've uh, I put it in a frame and hung it up. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Got to so, be on par with that Hawthorne jersey, surely. Oh, those are the days. Three peats. <laughs> and then this one up here, that's uh, that's Nathan Hindmarsh's jersey, like the, jer the replica jersey they wore in his last game. And it says, to the Oysters go the Eels. So you can get a little personal message signed on it. So, nice. yeah. yeah. And for those people playing along at home, you can see it just in the corner. It goes around the corner a little bit. That's a signed Cadell Evans frame which uh first australian to win the tour de france which is very exciting so yeah i don't know what other topics can we fill a couple of minutes with while people uh while people log on <laughs> you need something from you need something from cam smith on the wall after after the weekend just gone yeah on yeah. the assumption you follow your golf i do a little i follow most sports not <laughs> all of them as closely but uh yeah i follow i follow it a little bit i can tell you that the answer was two beers that he could fit in that jug. <laughs> Is that right? It looks like a yeah. two, maybe two and a half. Well, he said pre he said pre pre party that he thinks it could hold two, and then he put out a, a video saying that he can confirm it holds two beers. <laughs> which uh, which for those people who know Cam Smith, that two beers aren't probably going to last very long. So, no. <laughs> you play golf, Brad? Oh, in another lifetime, I did. Yeah, yep. yeah. Yeah, not with not with the kids, mate. You know, it's like with little people. It's too hard to put four or five hours away to sneak out for a game of golf. Yeah, I ride I ride mountain bikes, and it's uh, it's you know it's half an hour to drive to some trails, and then ride for an hour and a half or so, and then you know half an hour, twenty minutes back. Then you got to wash your bike. It becomes a half day exercise, it does. which is great for me, but the the rest of the family don't seem really impressed. <laughs> Sounds like you get away with it. You'd probably just do it during work hours anyway. Uh, sometimes, yeah, sometimes. Yeah, I was thinking about it on Friday. I might go Friday afternoon. As, uh, um, go Friday afternoon, then I'm booked in for my first, fourth COVID vaccination, uh, going around and see uh, Rebecca there at Chisholm. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so, yeah, because we've got a busy weekend with kids' sports and and. Uh, daughter's 11th birthday party so to get the house is going to be full of 10 and 11 year old girls so i might i might try and get a second ride in <laughs> yeah that's a shot nip out yeah. for that yeah all right well we might we might jump into it we, we, i always give people a couple of minutes to to get started and log in get into their get onto their desk get their computer set up grab a cup of tea or coffee some water uh, but we do need to try and stick to the time frame obviously because we've got guests here that are giving up their time in the evening so Good evening to everybody who has logged on. Uh, welcome to this evening's Pharmacy Business and Career Network webinar with the topic being growing your business. Uh, my name's Daniel Oyson. Well, if you logged on early, you might've learned a little bit about me. And uh, while I'm a marketer, uh, mostly working with small and medium businesses, some of you might recognize my voice as the host of the Guild's PBCN podcast. But I'm gonna move pretty quickly uh, and, because there isn't a lot of time in the agenda and we need to get through to our speakers quickly, keep them on time. So with that in mind, we have three 30-minute presentations tonight for you and each presenter is going to be available to take some questions at the end of their presentation. So we would absolutely love for you, the participants, to be involved in those discussions. Uh, that is definitely how you get the most out of it. Uh, so please just post your questions uh, in the chat at any time. I'll be keeping an eye on them and I'll tee them up for the the, the presenters, but trust me, I've done loads of webinars in my time and I can tell you that the guests love getting questions from you. It makes them feel engaged and that you're paying attention. So please don't be shy, just pop them in the chat at any time. You don't need to wait until the end. However, as I mentioned once or twice, we are on a tight time frame, so we need to be respectful of people's time. So if we, if we have a few too many questions, I'll make sure I get you in touch with the presenters so that they can answer your question uh, post the webinar. Uh, but also, Post webinar, a reminder that this session is recorded and we'll make it available as soon as we can uh, on the Guild's YouTube channel. So let's kick off session one. 
pharmacies, we all know that they are at the forefront of primary healthcare uh, now more than ever. Uh, and, although it does present countless opportunities for collaboration and partnerships, whether it be with other healthcare providers or maybe local health networks or, or medical companies, et cetera. Uh, and as such, Brad Butt from Coolum and Court Pharmacy, who were, some of you will know, the Guild Pharmacy of the Year in 2022. So Brad joins us and he's going to have a chat to us about how to identify those opportunities in your community, how to make it work for your pharmacy, and also provide some insights into a, a real life community health hub, which Brad and the team run there at Coolum and Court Pharmacy. So Brad, welcome to the session. Thanks for joining us and you can grab the screen and you're in charge. Beauty. Thanks, Daniel. I'll see if I can't figure out how to put this on. I'm sure we'll be fine. Perfect. Righto. Um, so the, I, I'm going to try and talk in half an hour, which is probably nowhere near enough on uh, growing your business, particularly off the back of collaborations and partnerships. Um, Interestingly, there's, there's some, only some subtle differences between collaborations and partnerships. I'm not going to get into that. So for the, intent, for, for the purposes of tonight's presentation, let's assume they're one and the same. Um, so, so roughly what I hope to cover this evening is just around uh, traditional partnerships. And most of us in community pharmacy have got a lot of those traditional partnerships. So we'll get into a bit of that, identify them speciality and, and casting the net more widely. So where can we go? How can we find opportunities to collaborate and uh, foster partnerships beyond the traditional partnerships? What are these non-traditional partnerships and, um, and and growing your business with these partnerships? Um, right. Oh, so the, the traditional partnerships, um, you know, I think most of us are familiar with these. They're tried and tested and, um, you know, typically they involve people that are in your local in your local community. So if you know if you're in a regional population, you know it's probably the 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 town. If it's in a metropolitan area, it's probably a group of suburbs or some lo or a locality. I know here in Canberra we've got five suburbs in our little locality of about twenty five thousand people residents. Um, you know, there's four five, four or five pharmacies, half a dozen GP clinics you know, a bunch of physios, dentists, some psychologists, naturopaths. And these people are people that you're likely to have probably established some sort of a, a partnership with, be it, be it known or not. If you haven't, then you absolutely should. You need to identify these people, go out, introduce yourself. Um, you know, the GPs, you probably work pretty closely with them already because you do their prescriptions. So they're the main feeder into your business. But physios, dentists, psychologists, naturopaths, remedial massage specialists. These are all people that are absolutely worth going and giving a business card to. Um, tell them a bit about yourself. Tell them what you love. Tell them that you're passionate and you love helping your community and see what they do. Get an understanding of what they do, how you can refer to them. What are they passionate about? Are they, if it's a naturopath, is there something particularly they're really good with? Um, because we can't be specialists in all areas and we can rely on these people to, to help our patients. You know, and I think sometimes we can we can appear a bit capitalistic in that, you know, it's all about us and what are we going to get out of it? But it, it really shouldn't be. It should be about what our patients are going to get out of the the establishment of, of a relationship with somebody in the local community. Um, and maybe how you can support another local business. You know, we often talk about locals for locals. So, you know, rather than send them online to buy their herbs, you know, get them to go and see the local naturopath, um, support the local dentist. So these are people that I would say in the traditional sense are part of your day-to-day -day business. They, they are realistically the, the people who most support your business and they're pretty critical to the ongoing success of the business. If you don't have these relationships established, you need to establish them and, and that can make quite a difference in the day-to-day -day running and profitability of your business, but also in terms of the pleasure you take from, from working as part of a larger team. Um, and as, I, as I've said there, it's built on mutually beneficial relationships. And sometimes you won't get anything out of the relationship. And you know what? That's cool. It might be that you know that you've got a really good physio that specialises in women's pelvic floor, you know, in the same building or down the street. Great. You know, that is where you want to send your, your mums that have had bubs or the older ladies that have got urinary um urinary incontinence issues so that they can get some support and get the right answer. It might not be drug related, which is really nice. So make sure you've got them robust. They should absolutely be robust. If you reckon you've got them robust, 
then you need to talk about you need to talk about casting the net more widely. And I guess, and it's probably mentioned at the bottom of the slide, but basically, what you want to do here is identify people that you could collaborate with or partner with um, and support to the benefit of the patient. Um, so it's pretty simple in concept. So what you'll find though is that it requires you have a bit better understanding of the specialty area. Um, and we'll talk about the specialty areas in a little bit. So um, and, you know, here at, here at Coolman Court in Canberra, we do a few programs with opioid replacement and cardiovascular health, uh, men's health. So, you know, we're in touch with the specialists that, that oversee a lot of the management of those conditions, as opposed to the GPs. I think if you ask most specialists how much love they've got for their community pharmacists, most of them would say, none, I don't even know who they are. The patient just goes, gets their script filled and, and I hear nothing more about it, which is unfortunate because the specialists need a lot of support. Um, uh, you know, so as it says there, you know, the benefit is often more than is, is more than support for patients. It's about stocking the drugs the specialists use. So if I look at the men's health stuff, you know, the, they, the, the different urologists and medical oncologists want us to keep different forms of ADT. They have one that they really like for some reason, and that's what they want to use. So you need to keep it in stock for them. Tell them you've got it. Tell them but you know all about the drug and you, you'll support their patients. You'll tell, tell the patient about the side effects, the administration, you know, the duration of treatment. You've got to learn this stuff. That's part of the trouble though. So, you, you, you know, you've got, to, you've got to do your foundation learnings before you can go out and impress the specialist by your knowledge on the drug because it is more than just, it's more than um, keeping the, the drug on the shelf. You want to be able to offer something more than that. Um, so you're offering greater patient support and inevitably that looks good for the doctor because, they don't have the time, the specialists, to ensure that the patients across all the finer details. And they, they really need a pharmacist to, to talk that sort of stuff and support the patients quite holistically. And that could even be referral into an exercise physiologist or, you know, into their GP to get the bone mineral density checked. You know, if we're talking ADT, um, androgen deprivation therapy for prostate cancer. And th this, is, this, is not, uh, special, this is not unique to any one um, speciality. So, so that's, I think, a really interesting idea, working with specialists. If you're in a, in a metropolitan area, there's heaps of them. If you're in a regional area, they will fly into your regional area often um, or go to a, a local um, base hospital and, and work out of there. Um, so it's worth, if you're interested, getting in touch with them. This is obviously mutu mutually beneficial for both the patient, the business, and, and the specialist. Um, we tend to find that the patients that we look after in these areas um, are happier, they're healthier, they're more satisfied, they're better educated. Um, and as a result, everybody's everybody wins as a result of that. Um, I've just mentioned there, and the picture actually pertains to friction points. And if you think about it logically, these patients are going to be coming into, particularly ones that aren't well, are going to have heaps of friction points. And we know what they are in the pharmacy. If it's somebody who's got pain medicine, there's heaps of friction points. If it's somebody who's um, just had their prostate removed, there's going to be multiple friction points, things that are affecting their life that are slowing down their progress. So you can see old mate on the skis, he's got very little friction. So he, he skids through really quickly, really easily, has a great experience. The one on the grass, he's not slipping very far at all. So he's not going to enjoy sliding down the grass because there's too, minute, too much friction. So we need to figure out where these friction points are and how we can solve them. Um, so, so this is just as a, as a, this was put together over 30 seconds when I thought about Canberra, um, and this is not unique to Canberra, who can we work with? We can do fertility, we can do gynecology, oncology, urology, ophthalmology, gastroenterology, addiction specialists, so opioid replacement and, and the likes, cannabis, pain management, spinal cord injury clinics, neurologists, endocrinologists, the list goes on and on and on. And it's limited only by your imagination, what your passion is. There's no point saying, oh, I'll do all of that because it's it's not likely you can be a, a bit of an expert in all those areas, but you can certainly pick up a few of them and, and incorporate them into your business um, and better look after those specialist doctors and their patients. Uh, and that'll build goodwill around your business. And it gives your gives your staff a sense of pride that you're doing something different um, and it's rewarding work. It's not just the tick and flick. It's a more in-depth conversation. It might not be a paid consultation. It might just be providing marinas to the girls that are going into the, um, into the uh, gynecologist 
you might, might build that relationship so that you see them and you can talk about how does it feel when the marina goes in? Will you feel the string? How long is it in for? Is spotting bleeding normal? Like it's standard counselling points, but you just want to know them really nicely so that you can support the gynaecologist or her nurse who's doing those implants um, or the GP if there's a GP that, that specialises in those areas. So it's about knowing what's going on around you. There's also non-traditional partnerships, and this is this is the cool stuff, and this is, I suppose, what we've been fortunate enough to, to really um, leverage in our pharmacy and in the men's health business. So that you can see that there's a bunch of stuff, um, and I'm not going to go through the dot points. You can all read it. Um, but, but basically, we're working with some really interesting places. Some of them are drug companies, Abvi, Janssen, Silag, Johnson Johnson, Cipla, AstraZeneca. So these guys are big farm. They've got plenty of money and they'll, they'll support you if you've got good initiatives that you might want to roll out. So the example recently was we put on a, a GP education night here in Canberra and had 50 GPs come locally. And, um, and we, we had an online event for them as well. And there was another 50 odd low, um, that joined us online. And that was sponsored by Janssen, Cipla and AstraZeneca. So they gave us the money to put it on, host a dinner. Uh, it was really nice and, and flash and, uh, and a good opportunity to get specialist speakers in to talk to the GPs. And that, you know, that doesn't pay a dividend directly to us, but it, it all of a sudden identifies us as um, a knowledge expert and a place to go to get the information on, on this, in this case, men's health. Um, we've got a relationship with Continence Foundation. So we, we've got a Continence Smart accreditation for our pharmacy, which basically means if somebody comes in needing Continence support, we can help them and we collaborate with the Continence Foundation. Uh, bins for Blokes, equally, you know, we advocate for Bins for Blokes, which is a Continence Foundation um, initiative, which basically says there should be pad disposal bins in men's public toilets. And of course there should be. These guys have got incontinence, no different to a sanitary bin for a female who's got incontinence or, or period um, products to dispose of. So they should be in all the public toilets. And uh, we've been lucky to get them installed, the bins at the expense of our centre management into, into our toilets. And I'd encourage you, got you guys listening to to approach your centre management or your local shopping centre or your local council about getting them into public facilities. Trade Mutt. Trade Mutt's cool. Um, we're doing a bit of work with Trade Mutt and Budgie Smuggler um, to get some merchandise prepared um, to raise awareness about men's urological health. And that kind of works, right? Because they're working with trades people, um, Trade Mutt, so they've got a lot of high-vis stuff. Um, they're talking about mental health, so that ties in really nicely for the services we offer. And they're going to help us put together a range of product and equally budgie smuggler. I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory when you're talking about urological health. Um, uh, so that, you know, so that's really unusual, something completely different. Um, and it's way outside big pharma and health, but, but someone you can collaborate with and partner with and then, and the Australian government. So uh, men's health Then under is the Australian sponsor for a bunch of medical devices, penis pumps and, penile clamps and stuff. And yeah, this is super specialized, I, I know, but but it's another example that you can have partnerships with companies overseas um, and, and be the Australian sponsor. And that's not a not saying you take on lightly. It's pretty, pretty high, high pressure at times. And you've got to report to, to all sorts of people, including the TGA and the, and the uh, manufacturer overseas. But that's the sort of they're the sort of stuff, that's the sort of stuff you can do if you've got the the passion, I suppose. And uh, you, you're on, you've got a, a little gem of an idea that you might be able to bring to market. Um, the other thing that I suppose is not on there is if you've got some good ideas and you're implementing services in your pharmacy, you can actually collaborate with other pharmacies. So, you know, we've done a lot of work with other pharmacies, helping them implement services, particularly in the men's health space. Um, we've got some fabulous pharmacists from Tassie here at the moment in Canberra that are learning all about men's health to implement services down in Hobart, which is going to be great. Um, and it's, you know, it's a sharing of information. You know, we're not in competition. We've got to support one another. So this sort of stuff is the really cool stuff and it's the really enjoyable stuff. So when you're not at work, in your business, working hard, and you have the opportunity to, to work on your business outside of the, the four walls of the store, this is the sort of stuff that's really cool to have a think about what you can do. I guess the important thing here is, and, and it, was, it was said to me, is you've got to go fishing where the fish are. So at the end of the day, you can put a lot of time and energy into growing these partnerships and collaborations and thinking outside the square. Um, 
but if you're not if you're not doing it on something you're passionate about, if you're not doing it with the right people, you're not you're not fishing where the fish are, and it ends up being something that may not work. And it's okay if you think you've done a if the, if you've got your lot ducks lined up and you've done your homework and you've figured out who you can partner with and what you're passionate about. If it doesn't come off, then that's okay. And um, I think it's important to realise that. But it's also important to know when to pull a pull a pin on something. So if it's not working after six months, 12 months, whatever you think is reasonable, then pull a pin on it and look for other opportunities. It doesn't hurt to have something fail. And in fact, that's how you learn. And I've had a few a few great ideas that failed. Um, so don't be afraid of failure, but, but make sure that you're sensible in the way that you go out and attack these projects. You want to get a return on investment. I mean, this is why we're in business. It's got to stack up financially. I've always maintained if you put the patient at the centre of everything you do, then it will financially stack up. And I maintain that. Um, so, so, you know, always the patient must be at the centre of what you're doing and, and it will financially work out. But you should you should actually analyse that. And you can talk to your accountant about what, what metrics you should be looking at um, in terms of, you know, staff wages to, to consultation fees and, and sales that might, that might develop as a result of the service you're providing, be it OTC um, or, or prescription, because those metrics aren't normal for a traditional community pharmacy. You know, you're familiar with, you know, uh, turnover compared, you know, your, your profit line as a, as a percentage of rent or wages to, to turnover, those sorts of things. So you might need to look at some different metrics to make sure that you're running on, on, on track there. Bandwidth, you know, we've, we've only, we can only juggle so many balls. So don't try and be a, a jack of all trades, you know, pick out the, the places where you think there's lots of fish and go fishing there. So put your energy into the right ones. And, and it can be really hard, you know, you've got to sometimes learn to say no and not take on too much uh, because pretty quickly you can find yourself doing stuff that was not your intention um, and it takes up your valuable time and takes you away from patients. So you've got to be careful of not exhausting your bandwidth. Team engagement, you, you can't be a one-man band. It's, it's, you know, any of your team that you can get involved, get involved, pharmacists, pharmacy assistants, dispensary technicians, the more support you can have from them, the better, not only because it lightens your workload, but it, 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 it helps engage them and gives them a bit of variety to their to their day to day existence. And you know, I think in community pharmacy at the moment with vaccination and rats, and you know, it's pretty exhausting. And and sometimes just have something a bit different that can take you away with a patient for a bit, or with you know, a big farmer or something. You know, a discussion outside of the, the these rats and and dispensing COVID medications and deliveries is really refreshing. Um, and it's important not just for your pharmacists, but for your, for your full team. So try and involve them where you can. Um, and, you know, that's where understanding who in your team is, is an innovator and who in your team is a, mo you know, a motivator and a maintainer, like doing those, put those um, personality profiles can be really beneficial to understand what everybody's work process uh, or work preferences. And so, you know, you can get them done by external HR companies and they, they can be really insightful. Um, you know, what does it mean to grow your business? You know, I think that that's an important question to ask. What do you what do you do? What do you, what is your what do you hope to achieve by doing this? Is it grow your bottom line, increase your turnover, br grow brand awareness, um, increase your goodwill, happier staff, mo more more engaged patients, maybe less transactional business, and probably it'll be a bit of all of those things, I suppose. Um, but but I certainly I certainly know by implementing specialized services and partnering with other pharmacies, with big pharma, with local specialists and GPs and doing something different, you know, you can attract, it goes, it goes beyond the, the profitability of the business. It actually helps you recruit and retract, recruit and retrain, retain staff. So, you know, if you have trouble getting an intern, but you're just ticking and flicking the scripts, maybe you need to look at how else you can engage um, interns in, in your business by doing something different and involving them in those partnerships and even asking them what are you passionate about because this is they've got the ideas I mean I'm just an, I'm a, a mature age pharmacist now that's um that, that's that's not that's got no ideas so I'm relying on the young ones coming through to say hey have you thought about this and uh, by doing a specialized service you, you know you can attract um, new staff new energy and and the good people in your business which I think is really really important so i get uh, uh, on q a um I, I, sometimes this can feel like a monumental task and i get that and and don't get me wrong this this sort of stuff takes years to perfect and get right um and there's a picture here of 
when I man, when I took some time out with a really good mate from uni, and we we climbed Mount Sonder on the Larapinta Trail out in the Flinders Ranges out uh, west of Alice Springs, two hundred and eighty odd k hike over a ten day period, and getting to the top of that was a monumental effort, and it can feel that way. So don't don't be afraid to to ask for help. Take it slowly, one step at a time. Rely on other people. You know, it's all that stuff that that teamwork and. Um, if you've got questions, please flick them through. I'm pretty happy to take calls at any point in time. Well, Brad, I've got a question, if you're happy to take one from me. Far away. So you said just to drop into some of those people who could make great partners, uh, give them a business card, have a little bit of a chat. For some people, not me, I'd be totally fine with doing it, but for some people that can seem a little bit daunting, sort of putting yourself out there, getting out from the comfort of the pharmacy. But is it something that when you do it, you find that those people that you're going and approaching are generally receptive to having a chat or do you get pushed away? No, always receptive, always receptive. And look, there's a way to do it. You've got to be respectful in the way you approach it. Um, probably one of, the, one of the more scary parts for me, was uh, was going out to the urologist's office for the first time as a young pharmacist with a pimply face, wet behind the ears, with no idea what I was going into. And the urologist sat me down at his big desk and he charges, you know, $150 for five minutes of his time. And he said, <laughs> right, oh, young fella, you know, tell me about how the how PDE5s work and why they wouldn't work for a guy who's had his prostate removed. I was like, oh, wow, you know, that's uh, that's that's heavy. Um, and, you know, I, fortunately, I, I managed to stumble across the correct answer. But... Um, but yeah, sometimes getting that showing the showing you've got credibility is really daunting. And uh, you know, I think pharmacists are fairly humble people by and large. And you know, putting yourself out there can be hard. So if it's not exactly for you, but this and this is why I was talking about those pro, the the um, personality profiles for your business, I suppose, Daniel. Because if you get them done, you're going to know who the extroverts and introverts are, and you're not going to send an introvert out to sit in front of a urologist. I mean, that 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 that's that plan is set to fail but if you've got an, an extrovert absolutely send the extrovert and the and the introvert out maybe the introvert's a really good clinical pharmacologist send them out with the intro with the extrovert and let them do it together so it doesn't have to be done on on one person's own and and frankly going to the physio to introduce yourself and say good days it, it, you know it need not be daunting even even to do something really simple and, and we've done this a few times call up the practice manager and say hey listen you know, I'd love to come out and say good day. We see the odd patient from you guys, whether you do or not really is probably beside the point. We see the odd patient come through and we thought it would be nice to come and say good day. How about we bring around a little plate of morning tea and uh, we'll come out there and uh, it would be lovely to, to get to know the team out there and, uh, and and have 10 minutes with you guys. And, and they're, they're, pretty re they're pretty receptive with a bit of tucker um, or a letter. <laughs> it, it could just be a letter. You know, you can get some really good template letters. And I know we've done that before with smoking cessation programs. This is what we're doing. Um, please, if you've got any patients that would benefit, send them down. And if you'd like us to come out and tell your team more about it, we, we're more than happy to. So it really depends on the level that you want to go to. Um, and it could be a really passive. This is a program we're doing this is what it is. Support us if you think it's a good idea or if you, you don't have the specialised services in your doctor's surgery or physiotherapy or whatever. Um, but it can be a bit a lot more aggressive where you're actually partnering with them and finding out where the opportunities are to support them and their patients better. Yeah. Oh, Brad, there's no other questions, but I thought I might just sort of reiterate or, or, or summarise some of the key points that I think I heard uh, you make. And I think it's it's really important that some of these things that you're talking about pharmacies trying, people shouldn't be scared because it's not going to send your business under. If you, if you roll a program out or you go and speak to 10 GPs or a couple of urologists and it just falls flat on its face, your business will survive. It won't make or break your business. And so I think it's a really good point that you make about some of those ideas and programs that don't work, that that is how you learn. Like, I'm a really experienced podcast host. I've done hundreds of podcasts for, for multiple clients and I produce the podcast. I work on the audio. But if I go back and listen to my earlier work, my ears dead set bleed. Like I'm embarrassed by that work. Um, but it is an important step to be able to learn and to grow and to find your groove and to get your confidence. So, you know, I don't, it's not one of my favorite sayings, but there's that one about how you need to break a few eggs to make an omelet. You probably have to go and stuff up a few meetings with people before you find your rhythm and, and your groove. And look, I can tell you, um, people that are experienced 
business people that work as consultants and managers and all that sort of stuff, they face exactly the same problem. So it's not unique to you uh, as a pharmacist just because you're getting out of the pharmacy and doing something that's a little bit different. As a marketer, I can 100% confirm that point that Brad makes about making sure that you put the patient in the center without boring anybody too much. Chapter one of any good marketing textbook is gonna have a, a, a diagram in it called the marketing mix. And without running through it, the thing that sits in the center is the customer. For you guys, it's the patient. And everything we do is a direct response to their needs, wants, or problems. Uh, and that's how we, we get success by, by uh, creating those products and services that are a response rather than sitting in the corner in a staff room going, we should do this, and then trying to find an audience that is receptive to it. Um, and also the point that you make about fishing where the fish are, I love that, that, that saying, I'm going to steal it when I talk to clients, because when I talk to businesses about marketing, I always say, go and hang out where your target audience hangs out. And the example I always give, and it is quite stark and it gets a little bit of a chuckle, but it 100% drives the point home, is that if I'm selling funeral services, TikTok's not going to help me. LinkedIn's not going to help me. Uh, sponsoring the local fate at the primary schools, not going to help me. I want to go out and find out where old people are who are probably going to die in the next 20, sort of 10 to five to, to 20 years. That's bridge clubs. It's walking clubs. It's the lawn bowls clubs. I'm going to hang out there and I'm going to create relationships with them and build trust. Right. And it's that exact analogy is go and fish where the fish are. So I, I really like that. Um, Brad, Always a pleasure, always insightful. Um, thanks for joining us. And obviously we'll make your presentation uh, available on the, the Guild YouTube channel. So um, I don't know if you're going to hang around, but I appreciate your time. Thanks, Daniel, mate. I'll probably drop out. But if anybody needs us, you're always welcome to give us a buzz at the pharmacy at Coolerman Court or uh, get in touch on the email. Always happy to field a question. Outstanding. Thanks again, Brad. Uh, people, next up we have Alexander Hughes, who is a solicitor at Meridian Lawyers in Sydney. So if you're planning to grow your business, you're interested in gaining a financial interest in a pharmacy, or maybe you're looking to expand your existing pharmacy footprint, or maybe you're even proposing to collaborate with, with others, then it's a very exciting time for you and your business, but very stressful uh, as well. So you really do need to be uh, equally uh, aware of the legal regulations that apply with expansion and growing your business. And so Alexander is going to give us a practical session that addresses some of those issues to consider when growing your business, uh, help us to avoid the common pitfalls and to manage those, those risks, which are all important. So Alexander, welcome to the session and thanks for joining us. I'll pass over to you now. Thanks, Daniel. Um, pleasure to be here and, and um, lovely to see so many participants in the chat as well. It's really nice to see. So I hope um, some of the words I have to say are, are helpful. Um, as Daniel said correctly, uh, all of the topics that I'm going to hit on today are actual examples that I've dealt with. Um, there's about seven or eight of them. So uh, it's very common area, very complicated, which is uh, I'm sure half of you are aware or more than half about the rules and regulations that dictate this space. So there are a lot of common examples that you don't uh, want to find yourself falling into. And we'll just hit a few on the head uh, with this. My apologies in advance that they sound quite nasally. Um, I'm actually under the weather at the moment. I feel touch sick. So if any of the participants in the chat uh, know any good pharmacists, uh, please feel free to let me know. Um, maybe they can help me out after I help you guys out. Um, so I'll start with a little bit of background about myself, just very briefly. Um, I'm a part of the corporate and commercial team at Meridian Lawyers. Um, and my experience includes uh, assisting clients, uh, business related clients, especially pharmacists, but also other professionals, um, specific to the pharmacy space, um, sale and purchases of pharmacies, uh, the legal issues associated uh, with uh, expansion, contraction and relocation, which I'll touch on today. Um, in particular, the pharmacy location rules, which are quite extensive and can be intimidating, particularly if anyone's ever looked at the handbook. Um, so I'll try and simplify a little bit with some examples of that. Um, preparation of ownership agreements and retail leases, which is very important and it will be my hot tip for the whole presentation, which I'll be saving for the end. Um, so please stick around. And uh, finally, I do deal with litigation of business disputes, which I won't touch on today, but 
is something to always be aware of. Um, I don't intend to speak for the whole 30 minutes um, that have been allocated. So if anyone does have any questions, please feel free. I've scheduled some time for it. So if anything does come up, um, please feel free to ask away. The topics that I'll cover are just there on your screen. Um, as I said, these are all from real world examples um, from working at Meridian. So um, these are very common things that can happen. People can um, either have basic questions about, for instance, relocation and, and, the, and the rules and regulations around that, or such can find themselves in trouble. Um, that's often or occasionally why you um, seek legal advice, uh, unfortunately. Um, but sometimes it's just about general advice and some assistance. And there's, um, I, we completely welcome all advice. It's as, um, as the previous speaker articulated, it's always better to ask questions if you're unsure, particularly when it pertains to rules and regulations of this space. The national law is quite complicated. Um, and so asking questions or, or getting confirmation that what you're doing is the right thing before you make the decision to lock yourself into growing your business um, is very important because you don't want to find yourself either doing something wrong or finding that um, uh, that what you're planning on doing is something that's outside of um, outside of the law. So the topics I'll be hitting on are just on the screen: um, financial interests, who can have one, um, relocation, expanding and contracting of pharmacies. I'm going to spend quite some time on that topic, mainly because this is a seminar about growing your business, obviously, and there are very strict rules about relocation or, or sorry, when I say rules, I should say um, application and procedures that need to be followed for these things. Um, so I'll touch on that with a, with a more basic example because it can get quite complicated. Um, professional services rooms, there's some background about that if you're interested in, in growing yourself into those bigger rooms. Very briefly, just a quick point on advertising. I'm by no means an expert on the advertising in this space, but just a real world issue that I'll touch on just so that everyone's aware. Um, and then written agreements. And then my hot tip at the end will be about leases and how to best deal with them when you're thinking about either relocating, expanding your pharmacy, or maybe even opening up a new pharmacy um, in addition to your current ones. So first and foremost, financial interest. Um, as all of you who own pharmacies are probably aware, um, in New South Wales, only registered pharmacists can have a financial interest in a pharmacy business. That's pursuant to the National Law Act, Schedule 5F to be specific, um, but it, it's very important that this is um, the crucial part of the law and who can have a financial interest. This is particularly relevant for you as pharmacists as um, there are examples and it's, it's happened in, um, in our practice where pharmacists who find themselves developing relationships with doctors, for instance, or in a medical hub um, where it can be seen from maybe the doctor's perspective or the medical center's perspective that, hey, you know, we're next to you, we're referring you all this work, um, we should be getting some sort of share of the profits or some sort of gain for all this work that we're giving to you. Can't happen that way, it's unlawful, um, and only a pharmacist can have a financial interest. There are also very limited exceptions to this. They usually come from the minister themselves providing some sort of um, acceptance of that approval. So it's quite rare and it's definitely outside um, the norm. So the major point I want to hit on, and it's really a three pronged topic uh, wrapped into one, but it's, um, it's relevant and, and, and very important for growing your business that you're aware of it. And that's the relocation of a pharmacy. It also includes some expansion and contraction, which hits on very similar application processes. But for the purposes of simplifying it, I'll keep it to the relocation of a pharmacy aspect. This is relevant when growing your business. If, for instance, you're looking to move your pharmacy from a smaller premises to a larger one, um, but this example is also relevant to expansion. Um, for instance, if you buy the shop next door, want to knock it down and combine the space to give yourself a bigger premises, most of these things will still apply. First and foremost, as it pertains to relocation, there are two applications you need to make. One's for the Pharmacy Council of New South Wales. And the others to the ACPA, okay? Two separate applications. The one to the Pharmacy Council, just as an idea of the documents that you're gonna require for them, is a franchise agreement, if you have one, if you don't, no worries. A copy of your lease, an executed and completed lease, 
Now I'm going to touch on this at the end, but the key part about that is that it's completed and it's executed. It's not a draft or an idea of what the lease is going to be. Whether or not you have a professional services room intended for the space, whether there's a service entity company. The main one as well is finance. So any loan finance agreement or any other documentation that you uh, have undertaken to pay for the space, if you're taking on finance for the facility, needs to be provided to the pharmacy council and preferably the agreement that goes along with it. Furthermore, other documents you need are the premises plans, the floor plan with various markings on them, including the entry exit, the total area and the dispensary area, and also a layout plan. <clears throat> Once this application is made, the pharmacy council is gonna arrange for an inspection of the premises for you. That usually happens quite quickly. And then an outcome after that is expected to be within 10 days. The reason why I write possibly longer on this slide is unfortunately, possibly due to COVID-19, the pharmacy council is quite snowed under and backlogged with applications at the moment, at least in our experience, and can take longer than 10 days at the moment. It's without criticism. Um, it's just the way in practice these um, applications appear to be coming back. So it's just be wary that whilst the application does say 10 days, maybe longer than that. The key one, or the, the, uh, the more daunting one to the eye is the ACPA application. The reason why I say it's more daunting is it's split into existing premises application sites and new premises application sites. And within those two trees, there are uh, four or five or six different items where you can fit yourselves in. It's very important to get the right category and they are very specific. So it can be quite intimidating to someone looking at the application, uh, a non-lawyer, but the ev and even lawyers um, intimidated by the volume. These are found in the pharmacy location rules handbook, which is available online. But when I say it's daunting and specific, you can see on the screen that one application aspect is in relation to if, if the relocation is within one kilometer, but if it's outside of the one kilometer, even by 500 meters, which is one, two, five, there's a separate category, okay? The same is one, two, three, then gives it to 10 kilometers. So it's very specific and it's ultimately very important that the right application is made. Now, once it's identified that the right application is made, the documentary material is quite similar. I'm gonna use an example um, in a moment, but it's just important to not be, well, whilst to not be intimidated by the breadth of it, it is ultimately very important that the right application is made so that it can be approved. These are an example of the new pharmacies application. Again, you can see that there's eight different ones, very specific once again, 1.5 kilometers, 10 kilometers, small shopping center. The example I'm going to use, you don't need to read the writing on the screen, this is just the example of the highlighted one, is a relocation of up to one kilometre, so within a kilometre, and the premises are not a designated complex. A designated complex is defined, and it means a small shopping centre, a large shopping centre, or a hospital. So we're going to use this basic example just to show you um, the breadth of documentation that's needed. Now, I don't say breadth of documentation to intimidate anyone or to discourage them from growing their business. It's just to be aware that there are various things that need to be done once you make the decision to do that. And it's very important that they're done right. Um, as a lawyer, obviously, I would recommend seeking legal advice once that decision is made. But ultimately, it's just for you to be aware now at the processes and documents you're gonna require before getting that approval so that ultimately you can grow your business and gain what you think. So I won't read all of these out, but they're just on the screen. This is just in relation to the surveyor's scaled map that you need. It needs to tick all of these boxes. It's obviously up to outsourcing that to a professional surveyor to do that, but they need to be aware of what they're providing you and so that it complies with what the ACPA wants. So these things on the screen, i.e. the margin for error, the straight line distance, the description of the equipment used, et cetera. This is just in relation to one document. Other things that you require, by the way, this is in the relation to the non-designated complex, as I said, uh, would be a photograph of the existing and adjoining premises, 
an accessory declaration from the manager of the new premises of the building, uh, confirming that it's not a designated complex. So that's something that you can either arrange or make inquiries with the manager of the new premises yourself um, or through a solicitor. General requirements for not only relocation, but other things in the ACPA application are there on your screen. I won't go through all of them in great detail, but the key one that the ACPA, uh, key ones that the ACPA are concerned with are the one at the bottom there, that the premises are not directly accessible by the public from within a supermarket. They take a lot of importance and care about that. So you just need to know and be across that. The other one is the second last one from the bottom which is that you're able to operate, begin operating within six months of your application being recommended to be approved. These are the other documents that you will need for this relocation. So the first one there is a particularly interesting point and comes from um, a matter that we worked on uh, at Meridian, which is that the street address is clearly identified and if the premises is known by more than one address, that evidence is, is used to demonstrate that this is the case. There was a matter that we worked on where the pharmacy had approval at a certain address, but the address advertised on the Google, uh, on the Google page and on this pharmacy's website was a different street address. The street number was different. This client approached us to sell their business and it created a lot of problems because it appeared that the pharmacy, or that the approval that it currently had um, might have been incorrect because of the street address. So it's very important to make sure that if you are buying, selling or relocating or, or what have you with the new address, that it's the correct address. And if it is known by two addresses, sorry about that. If it is known by two addresses, um, that it's particularized in your application. There are other things in here like the fit out, right to occupy um, and the lease, but that's some really uh, an interesting thing that many people might not think about is getting the correct street address. It's very basic, obviously, uh, but can be important. In relation to expanding or contracting a pharmacy, two examples um, from some pharmacy work that uh, we've done at Meridian. The first one is I mentioned a bit earlier in relation to expanding. If a pharmacist wants to take on an additional lease of the shop next door and turn the shops into one, knock down the walls or something like that, they're gonna need an expansion footprint and they're gonna to need to make an application to the pharmacy council for approval before they do that. So this is something to note before you sign leases or things of that nature, when an opportunity presents itself, to make sure that you are aware that you need the pharmacy council's approval to do certain things. A good rule of thumb, essentially is that for you to do anything, most things in relation to expansion or growing, you're gonna need the pharmacy council's approval to do so. Similarly, if any pharmacists are looking to sublet part of their current premises to a GP or a medical center or, or, or anyone for that matter, that the contraction footprint also needs to go to the pharmacy council for approval. So even if you're downsizing or selling some of your space, you also need pharmacy council approval. It's very important to know before you enter into legally binding contracts that um, some things may be outside your control, i.e. the pharmacy council. And I'll touch on that with the leases at the end. Next topic is professional services room. Um, for those that don't know, professional services rooms are premises associated with, but separate to an approved pharmacy. As defined in the national law, effectively they're on pharmacy premises or a place where a pharmacy business is involved that involves the following. The preparation or packaging of drugs under the supervision, personal supervision of a pharmacist for supply to individual patients or healthcare facilities and the storage of those drugs. Two important things, uh, both for, from real world examples, is that the features of these is that they can, the pharmacy, the professional services rooms can either be within the approved premises or they can be separate but associated with the approved pharmacy premises. And if that's gonna happen, or either of those things are gonna happen, there needs to be a pharmacy council application, all right? So that it's up with the approved premises. The second part of this page is where the example comes in. We had a, a pharmacy who was looking to expand and opened up a, an, an opportunity presented itself across the road uh, with some property. And they decided to uh, buy that property or lease it, I should say, 
and open up a professional services room where they decide to do their Webster packaging. Unfortunately, uh, there was no pharmacy council approval for this uh, professional services room in this space, and it wasn't associated with the pharmacy. It's very important that, and as I said, a good rule of thumb is that pharmacy council approval um, is required before you do most things, okay? Be or you can risk um, violating the law and finding yourself in trouble. As an added important, uh, important point, if you are gonna open a professional services room that's not on the premises, it needs to have its own separate personal pharmacist. So looking, supervising the, the premises. So if it's separate and it's not with the associated approved premises, there needs to be another pharmacist who's personally supervising that space. The application to the pharmacy council involves those documents on your screen, uh, a lease, finance agreement, the plans, locational plan, pretty much the same uh, in parts as, as the other application. Just a quick one on advertising. Um, I'm by no means an expert in the advertising of pharmacies, but the key thing to realize is there are strict rules about pharmacies advertising schedule three products. Um, as I'm sure you're all aware, schedule uh, three products as defined in the Therapeutic and Poisons Act, um, other as a certain um, products within there, there are very strict rules about advertising directly to the public. There are some exceptions, um, but for the most part, window banners, leaflets, point of sale material, the conspicuous display of goods themselves um, are illegal. As, in, as under that act, okay? The purpose of that is to ensure that the pharmacists have the principal role in initiating that treatment with the Schedule Three drugs. And so it's just important to be aware that if you're collaborating with a health hub or, um, or others or other business partners, that they're aware of the advertising rules as it pertains to those four years. In relation to written agreements with business partners, there are various things you can do. Uh, partnership or shareholder agreements might be appropriate, joint ventures or deeds. Um, without going into too much detail about the difference between the documents, just various ways that companies can be set up um, may require different agreements or deeds, uh, but there are different ways and avenues in order to set up um, agreements with um, partnership agreements with other pharmacists or, or shareholding arrangements. Um, and I would recommend that you speak with an accountant rather than a lawyer about the best way to set up your company structure. A key part about when entering into negotiations with someone, however, is which which many people might not be aware of is that instead of committing yourself to a legally binding contract at first instance, is that pharma or not just pharmacists, any party has the ability to uh, to uh, negotiate or speak is is a better word touch base with a memor with a memorandum of understanding between the parties. This is basically a document that's between a handshake deal but not a legally binding contract. And the way, reason why this is important is that it can be discussed between the parties and have something written down really to understand the position of both parties um, in what they're after, um, any clauses that may, future, may end up being in the future contract or what have you. The position of the parties is important to maintain good communication so that everyone understands what the ultimate agreement may look like. Now, as I said, it's not legally binding. Um, however, it is important and as good practice, I think, would be to have on that memorandum that there is not the intention that it is legally binding, because um, if it looks like a contract rather than a memorandum of understanding, the courts may see it as being a contract. So that's just some legal jargon about the importance of things, and, but uh, the importance of written documents, but it is, um, it is a risk. So a way to get around that is to write that it's not legally binding, but it's effectively a way for the parties to touch base. Now, my final point and the key takeaway that I want everyone to be aware of when growing their business by uh, looking at new premises or, or what have you, is what to do about your leases, okay? Now, you would have heard me, dis heard me discuss earlier that both the Pharmacy Council and the ACPA require you to have an executed lease before approval. But what does that mean? What that means is you're being required to enter into a lease without knowing whether you have the approval to actually run your business on those premises. So the key part about this is, is that to protect yourself as the pharmacist or the person um, looking to uh, be the lessee in this space, 
is to have what's called a condition precedent, or at least that's uh, the way that I phrase it in relation to the lease. But it, basically what it means is a clause within the contract that says that this lease is conditional upon the following. And this can be anything on the following depending on your certain circumstances. But in relation to leases specifically, it should say that the this lease is conditional upon you receiving approval from the pharmacy council and then also that the lease is conditional upon you receiving approval from the ACPA. The reason why this is important that you are aware of this and make sure that it's within your lease is that many of solicitors for landlords, particularly those that don't deal with pharmacists, may not be aware of the regulatory requirements of the pharmacy premises and arrangements. So you don't want to be in a position where you're in a legally binding contract of a lease for a premises where you can't operate your pharmacy because your application doesn't go through. So it's really important to just be aware of that. I noticed the time, I think I'm towards the end. So I hope that's been really helpful for everyone. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free. Um, I'll try my best to answer them on the run, but um, um, please feel free to fire away. Well, Alex says uh, all good hosts have, oh, I've got a couple that I've come up with while you were, <laughs> while you were okay. talking. Um, but just a, a, a quick one, Alex mentioned about some of those rules and regulations around uh, advertising. So if you are looking for more on that front, the Guild's uh, PBCM podcast has a whole episode on it, uh, episode 72, and I'll mention more about the podcast and how to find it again at the end of the webinar. But Alex, the question, uh, the first question I've got for you is, expanding or even just changing a business can be pretty stressful uh, for the business owners and even the staff that are involved in helping make that happen. So sometimes it can just be easier and more comfortable just to just to stay the same. But when you work with pharmacists to expand, what sort of feedback do you get in the long term about whether they found it a good idea or not? Yeah, that's a good question. I think the feedback normally is, um, and speaking candidly, um, the process of getting through applications and things can be intimidating um, and it can be stressful. I find that uh, most of the people that approach us are quite thankful for uh, the solicitor taking the brunt of that sort of pressure because it can be quite intimidating and, and there is a lot of words, particularly in those handbooks. But I think once you get through that initial stress and, and sometimes it's unwarranted stress, obviously, you want it to go well, uh, you, you, you know, you're putting your eggs or your chips in. Um, to expand and you want it to go well and, I, and, and that comes with pressure and stress and I think that's obviously very natural. I think at the end of it when it goes through which usually it does these applications um, it, it's relief first and foremost but gratitude and I think excitement is the main thing um, you know it's very uh, exciting to expand and give yourself this opportunity and I think that's for the most part what people experience at least in my case. Very good so Alex, the other question I have for you is often the motivation for expanding a business, a pharmacy, it's going to be reasonably simple. It often just comes back to the ability to make more money. And that's fine. It's a commercial venture. Nobody, uh, you know, nobody hides that fact. But what about the other end, the contraction, which you spoke a little bit about earlier? What sort of indicators do people see and do you work through that makes them pursue a contraction of a pharmacy? Hmm. Well, the, 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 thing, the key thing about that is too, is that a contraction doesn't necessarily mean that you're downsizing or, or looking to take a step back or that you've bitten off more than you can chew. Sometimes contractions can be great things. Um, as I said, um, in the example that was used about the contraction with um, having a medical center or, or a doctor come in into that space, it can be quite good for the business, particularly if you have a good relationship with that, uh, what effectively becomes sort of like a tenant in that it brings work. Um, the doctor's right there next to you. Um, and so sometimes it can be a good business decision and actually be more profitable to do it that way. Um, so it's not necessarily the case that a contraction means, you know, I've, I've, I've got too much going on here. Or um, a failure. Can, or a failure, that, exactly right. It can be a very commercial decision um, to do that. Um, it can also be the case that it's, um, the equivalent of making the, um, the same amount of money or profit, um, but with less work or less things to go on for people that are, um, you know, looking to uh, retire or, or outsource some of their work or, or what have you. So certainly by no means means it's a failure. In fact, in the example I was speaking about, it was, it was a business decision to do it that way 
um, to be more profitable. Yeah, because I think there's a misconception sometimes that 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 growth is always going to be amazing, and it's the only way to pursue either uh, a better commercial outcome or even a better uh, work life balance. You know, we'll grow more, which means I'll make more money, which will make me happier, which is not always always the case. So, Alexander, um, great chat, great presentation. Um, thanks for your time. I'll let you go. Thank you so much, Daniel, and thanks to everyone for listening. I really enjoyed it. Okay, and lastly, we're going to hear from internationally renowned retail expert, Brian Walker from the Retail Doctor Group. Now, Brian's going to take us on a whistle-stop trip of sorts around the world uh, and explore the global retail innovations and best, uh, best practice in retail that he sees. Uh, and as he shares his knowledge and proprietary business fitness tools to help us all improve our retail business fitness, uh, looking forward to this presentation because I think you're going to gain a real insight into how to best build, or sorry, how to build best practice retail into your pharmacy business. Obviously, we want to maximise the floor space we have available and uh, improve uh, the patient flow. So, Brian, welcome to the session. Thanks for joining us, and I'll pass over to you. How's that? Can everyone hear me? I can, yes. Can we see the screen? We can. Even better. Hi, everybody. Good to be here. I'm just going to pick up and talk about some of the things that we've seen and, and know. Let me tell you a little bit about briefly Retail Doctor Group, and thank you for the opportunity to be with you. Um, well, I started this about 16 years ago, and it's a business that has three elements to it, or three divisions. One is around insights. We hold methodologies for research from the, the classic research methodologies, uh, consumer profiling, neuromarketing profiling uh, through. Uh, and we also operate in uh, what we call business diagnostics, uh, strategy diagnostics, distribution and brand building and using those insights into deployment. And over the years, the deployment has many aspects, but it really is building on what we call the steps of business fitness. And they are the steps of business fitness that retailers, uh, good high performing retailers here and globally do particularly well. And uh, I wanna share some of those with you. And in particular around for our pharmacists and, and seeing as you would expect, how we can look to maximize our physical space, the shops, maximize them in terms of commercial returns. So that's me. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about strategy, branding, visual impact, performance around benchmarks, uh, the, the role of inventory in retail, um, certainly around the people model, and then a little bit into financial health of a retail business and a pharmacy business and what we look for. So invariably, you know, many pharmacists go out independently and collectively and take two to 300 square metre sites paying quite big rents in many occasions, sometimes much larger sites for that matter, can pay anywhere to you know, 25 to 30% of their revenue uh, in rent in many cases. And so they've got to be pretty good and pretty sharp around how they maximize that retail space. And one of the things that's quite evident uh, when you look at high performing retail and retail pharmacists is that there is a good sense of strategy a good sense of um, outcome and what that business wants to achieve, often documented, and some sort of cardinal rules around that are that as you set your sales plan and your sales forecast, it needs to be done in categories so that you're able to identify through a category mix uh, what your performance in the retail products are. Um, that needs to be married to a buying plan, so that's important that the two are wedded the sales category mix and the forecast and a good buying plan. Often we see businesses, um, you know, anecdotally estimating what their level of sales will be and anecdotally estimating the level of stock they'll need. And that brings them into some other areas such as discounting, having to reduce their profits and so forth and getting caught with stock that doesn't sell. Um, and so one of the classic questions for a pharmacist to consider is, What's their relative strength? What do they have a good, clear point of difference in? What are they almost category killers in? 
it's in a retail sense, you've really only got that three to 400 square meters and some, again, different sizes to work with. And it's better to be very strong in one or two categories and have a assortment in the other categories than being too thin across the ranges. And particularly, you know, if, if you're thinking about how do I maximize the, the space? Um, have I got a good brand? Have I got a good brand message? Incredibly important now to be collecting databases and, and customer customer details and building on, you know, building on building a database and a good future revenue around the retail. And what we're looking at this list and what I needed to say was that these are the things that an investor would look at. If I was buying a pharmacy from a retail perspective, I'd certainly want that pharmacist to have that clear point of difference, to have a good brand message, be on brand, have a good, strong, growing database. Certainly want them to be profitable. Ideally, they'd have systems in place that have good view of inventory, good reporting, good sales reporting. They could tell me sales by product, by mix, by category, good buying reports, open to buy and so forth with that. They'd have a pretty low reliance on the owner. Good staff, you know, a good 2IC who knows retail, understands the space well, has good customer relationships, leads people well. And quite often you see the higher performing pharmacies have exactly that pharmacist in charge, and then they have a retail expert in the team who builds this. And of course, like any good business, ultimately businesses buy and sell. And these are some of the ingredients that take us into the path of driving higher multiples. And of course, in pharmacy, we look at, you know, the mix of dispensary versus front of store. How do we make that retail footprint deliver these greater returns? And as you know, there are wide ranges between pharmacy category contributions, depending on the locations, of course, uh, PBS and so forth. Um, and what we see is that, you know, in some businesses like Chemist Warehouse, for example, on average, we see that at about a 30% dispensary, 70% retail mix. And that can vary from store to store. We, we've seen some of the Terry White, for example, looking at that 50-50 mix. And that's an important thing to consider. How dependent on is my retail environment, my pharmacy, on my script business? How independent is my retail business? And here we see, for example, this is just some data taken from shopping centre locations. Here we see the front store retail sales per square metre at $6,500, with an average sale of $13.20 for front of store. And they will vary, of course. Uh, dispensary sales per square meter, 16,900. You'd expect that, it's a smaller area. The total store average sale of $40.20. So what's interesting here is that mix between dispensary and retail. Now, sales per square meter in retail terminology is a really important measure because it measures effectively the sales intensity per square meter of space that's rented. So, you know, we, we see normal retail somewhere around, in pharmacy, somewhere around that five and a half to 7,000 square metres an average. Um, but again, size of store impacts on that. But it is a good guide to sales intensity and also level of stock intensity to make that, those sales. If we have too much stock, invariably that leads us into discounting and the store starts to look a bit boring if we're not selling through. And, in there, and consequ consequentially, if we have two lower stock levels, we can be missing sales. And of course, you know, pharmacies do need to differentiate and sort of unite around these, these areas of trusted health advisor. And we like to see good high-performing pharmacies with good information, good expertise, shelf talkers on product, well-trained staff, because you know, that's really the core positioning of pharmacy and then products in the retail space that support that. So the question for pharmacists, pharmacists like any business is, what makes us great? What's our point of difference in retail? And it might be, you know, natal care, it could be children, it could be aged, it could be any category that you can own. And we do encourage that. And that's also looking at demographics, market mix, uh, competitors, and then as I come through the saw through the shop, you know, 
well-stocked shelves, good category signage. Now, retailers always uh, plan in categories, buy in categories, sell in categories, promote in categories. So it's important to be thinking about how well is a category performing all the way down to the single unit or SKU in that category. When I stand outside that pharmacy looking in, is it appealing? Is the lighting strong? Is the layout good? Do people walk the entire shop to get to the, the script? Um, or do they, however they do it, do they use the space well? Is it impactful? Have I got a good story to tell as a pharmacist? And I, am I able to not just um, walk to one spot, but walk through the shop? Now, increasingly, as we know, we say that we spend up to six hours as customers now on smartphones and devices. So often many customers are particularly well informed. And so, yes, they're informed by the pharmacist naturally, but a lot of people are increasingly self-informed, particularly around uh, the online informed, particularly around products. So I expect, you know, that the need for staff to be better trained and more ex and have more expertise is important as well. Uh, when we look at pharmacies around the world, we see, you know, very classic pieces around, they use the space very well, they use good strong lighting, they'll use height, they'll make strong displays. Displays should always be about apples with apples, very strong, own the space. Important there to uh, use that space really well and use that lighting well. Delivering this point of difference around product and pricing information, appealing and relevant, story by category I've touched on, the line of sight, really important to be doing that well and consistently well. The, typically the prime space in the real estate, if you like, from a selling point of view, the store is the 20 foot semicircle inside the front door. Um, I'm told that up to 80% of us, are we Australians, uh, walk to the left when we walk into a front door. So it's important to keep our windows changing all the time. Fashion retailers change their windows somewhere between 45 to 50 times a year. Um, and good pharmacy windows are changing, possibly not that frequently, but certainly frequently. And invariably in shopping centres, somewhere between 70 to 80%, of, probably higher, 85% of traffic, are the same customers who live in that same primary catchment area. With the exception of the big A-grade malls, that's typically the pattern. And so, you know, keeping it, ref keeping it refreshed, new product, new products of which you have invitation to play is important. Knowing the layout of your merchandise in stores, hot spots at the front, warm spots midway through the store, destination product towards the back. Um, so knowing your best sellers, high profit items, basic stocks, what are your impulse lines? What are your specialty? What is your profit on each of these lines at a prime level? How many do you need to turn in that space that I've touched on? And how are you going to build good add-on selling opportunities? And so once the customer's already purchased one item, it's easy to sell an additional item. So ensuring that we're laying merchandise out with a really natural add-on sale approach, and pharmacists are very good at this, not to overcrowd, um, but to certainly also use add-on items at the counter, not in pharmacy, but JV Hi-Fi are masters at this, and they have record results at the moment. Um, In-store signage. When, uh, when your customer stands at the front of a, the pharmacy, your pharmacy, they're invariably working through this transition of the doorway at the entrance, where they're working out what they want to see, where they want to go, how they want to get there. And that's our opportunity to navigate. And every good retailer knows that they never leave it for the customer to navigate the shop, they navigate the store. So good category signage, good on-brand messaging, good information because increasingly we're self-educating, um, really good access to understand what's going on through the pharmacy. Sometimes you'll see in pharmacies because for whatever reason, they'll build racks and shelves all the way to the ceiling and you don't get this openness and this visibility. I think it's important to try and maintain a line of sight wherever you can, and make it as easy as you can for customers. Um, this goes without saying, and you see it, you know, great examples in the pharmacy, approachable, engaging staff, eye contact, body language is important, good friendly face and smiling is important, good grooming, uniforms. Um, these are sort of the hygiene factors, if you like, of a 
of a good retailer and a good pharmacy retailer for that as well. Talk a little bit as we sort of whistle through this and we see this uh, in many different locations. We talk about something called category cardio, but it's inventory effectively. So I touched on it earlier, but when a, when a retail pharmacy carries too much stock, the effect is that uh, it can cause the cash flow to slow down. And sometimes if you look at the retail numbers, what we see is that the shops invariably buy too much stock. Um, the stock slows down, cash flow effectively constipates and the whole thing slows down. And then we end up in discounting. Um, so understanding buying, buying forecast by category, keeping some buying available for hot lines and seasonal lines. But to understand the elements of good working capital management is important as well. There's a nice study in the US that says that it's not profit that drives businesses out of business, it's cash flow. And the real productivity of inventory is about doing more with less. Um, and so one of the metrics that we look at closely is this area of stock term. So it's, it's interesting at a sales level for the store where we look at average sales, typically at retail, over a period of time, typically a year, divided by the average closing stock value at retail. And what that tells us is how many times a particular product is turned over. And good retailers look at this at the category level. So what they're saying is how many times has this product turned over at retail in this particular location? Has it paid its way? So we look at it, for example, and say, okay, you know, if you took two hypothetical pharmacy retail stores and you said one did uh, $900,000 in sales for the sake of discussion and had closed, had re average retail stock of 300,000, you'd say stock turns three. So on average, an item turning once every, uh, three times every year. Then we took another store and said, well, it turns over $900,000. And it has stock on hand of $450,000 at retail, well, its stock term would be two. Now, what that's telling us is that that store in that hypothetical is carrying $150,000 more stock than it needs to make those sales. So somewhere in there, it's not lining up its category sales to its sales mix. It's buying too much in one category, possibly not enough in another. And as a result, it's not in alignment with its point of difference, its uniqueness, most importantly, what its customer wants. And invariably, that often leads it to the age stock issue where stock just gets too old and invariably is, um, you know, attracting rent and labour costs every time someone touches it. It's slowing everything right up. And it obviously always leads us to discounting, which is not where we want to be. So... Inventory is actually one of the real drivers of good pharmacy retail performance. Knowing how to manage stock, sell through on ranges is, is critical. And what I like to do there is look at the categories and see what's performing and where's your money being made in your retail business? Where's your money being made? Where is your money being lost? And what is the efficiency of that? Inventory, they say, is a bit like a house guest that snores. Treat them nicely, get it in, and get them out quickly. And this is true of inventory. And, and notwithstanding that, we, we often say, you know, oh, look, let's hang on to this product in our retail side of our business because one day someone's going to come need that. Well, they now have an internet, an online offer as well, which they can get. Um, and another day I could talk about how to integrate into online. But today in the time available, it's just working us through some of those essential elements to drive value in our business. So inventory generates gross margin dollars, of course, but it soaks up cash. So when we go into pharmacy retail or any retail, we do look at buying processes. Are there good sales history by product, by place, by time, good sales forecasts? Do we have that open to buy plan? Because this is where the cash sits invariably. People, um, good pharmacies, good businesses have good guidelines around recruitment, induction, job description, performance appraisals, coaching, all those great things. And they are there. They tend to have really good two ICs and three ICs that I've touched on. 
they tend to have a good culture for encouraging performance. They might share some sales goals. Um, they're pretty motivated. They've got a good winning environment. The staff will spend time getting coached. Uh, they've got good consequences for compliance. And that's an important element as well. From a retail point of view, like we've talked about sales per square meter return on space, um, Jim Roy gross margin return on inventory, they're all important things to look at. Stock turn is a great ratio. It's handy too to have a look at sales per employee and give you a little bit of a sense of how productive your team members are on the floor and how well trained they are too when you invest in sales training programs. I like to have a look at transaction counts. That's handy to do and see what the productivity of your people at that time is. Rostering is important. Quite often we find that we have the same roster week in, week out for the same people. Good to move that around a bit and, and where you can change that a bit. Um, and from a retail point of view, if we're really wanting to drive this average transaction value and items for sale and sell more to the ones we have, this simple example is um, stores A, B, and C. So A is 15% of customers and spend an average of $45. Store B improves the conversion by 3% for a 20% for a sales increase. And store C maintains that conversion and lifts average sale by $10. That's a 22% increase on the same traffic. And you see the difference there just by selling more to the ones we have. Um, here's a quick example of a, you know, a point of sale or, or manual chart on who's performing well in some of these key metrics. Good retail management and pharmacy will do this and they'll get a good view of who's performing well. When you look at, um, when you look at us not getting our sales number or hitting those per square meter benchmarks that I've touched on, uh, you start to look at what are the, some of the drivers for retail staff and pharmacies about not achieving some of these numbers. Often it's lack of confidence in product knowledge. So teaching them about the products, the features and the benefits is an important part of a staff member's success. Um, I'll move through this really quickly. p and are nice and comparative. Just always look at the movement of money, the movement of costs, the movement and trends. So you know one particular report at any given time is relatively um, useless, but what's important to do is to be able to keep the tracking and trends on those numbers. Cash flow I've touched on, very, very important. Um, sell through of range of stock turns I've touched on. Now I want to do, say one quick last thing. We've built um, modules, fit for business modules, all this content available, a subscription, where we work very much on this cycle of continuous improvement, track, train, reward. And there's an RDG Academy, which is um, all our fit for business modules that are available. And they're available to pharmacists and other retailers on how to improve their business. And so we encourage you to have a look at that. And if there's any questions, I'm only too happy to take them. And that was meant to be a link, but it's not quite working. But if you have a look at retailacademy.retaildoctor.com.au, you'll get a good sense of not only how to survive, thrive, in all retail, but in turn, pharmacy retail. And just and while we have a little bit of a chat, Brian, you can just just leave that up there so anybody can uh, write yeah. it down and, and follow through it, on that. It Brian, is. Mm -hmm. Here you go. It has been over the years a reasonably, the retail space within a pharmacy has been comparatively underinvested in. Now we see businesses such as Chemist Warehouse really focusing in on that area. There's plenty of upside when it's done well. And, and driving those numbers is an important part of it. Thanks for the time to have a quick chat. And Brian, I liked your comment about how good retailers determine the movement of customers through a retail space, not the other way around, because I think we all know exactly how that plays out and what that means, because we've all been to Ikea once yeah. or twice and felt <laughs> like a little mouse being guided through a maze, but it is done very effectively. Um, Brian, I would love for you, to, if you can, uh, to share an example of a pharmacy you've worked with or maybe you've just visited, which has, has done that really well with maximising their space and, and, and guiding customer or, or patient flow. I'd love it if you could almost take us on maybe a little bit of a verbal virtual tour of sorts as, as in what it feels like for somebody to be in there and how it flows and all fits together. Are you able to do that? 
Yeah, I'm just trying to think. I mean, there's a number of good pharmacies. I think Pharmacy for Less do a good job. I think um, Chemist Warehouse do a good job in some locations. And and the I, the purpose is to be able to stand at that lease line, understand as a customer at the, at the entrance way, understand the customer, good, clear category signage, good, clear category assortment and ranges. It's fairly clear at the front. It's not full of dump bins and, you know, socks and sunglasses and all sorts of stuff. It's, it is what it purports to be a good pharmacy. I can logically see how the categories of pharmacy through, you know, um, vitamins through all the way through a clear crisp. I can see the scripts area at the back of the store. I can walk my way through lights are all working, great signage. I've got all the cues, the little shelf talk is telling me about product ratings and what's great. Uh, there's an ability sometimes in some stores to have some interactivity in there around digital. Um, and I'm able to sort of pop my head up and see across the base, see across the store. And there's a very obvious process for me to be able to walk through and you can see the add-on opportunities all the way through. So I think, you know, there's a number of pharmacies that do that particularly well. It's probably the ones that don't do it so well that are the obvious standouts. They tend to be cluttered, um, boxes on the floor, all the usual hygiene pieces. Product doesn't bear a lot of relationship to another product within a category. I also think it's important when you visit a pharmacy to know what they're great at, to know what their core, that they've really got some speciality in there. And I think that's going to be increasingly important as well. So that's how I'd answer that. Yeah, I think you make a good point or a couple of good points because it, 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 particularly around it, it's more the ones that we see that don't work well that really uh, stand out because it's quite confronting. It's quite frustrating for patients in those uh, situations. It reminds me of when you go, you go and do your grocery shopping at the same supermarket all of the time, but then suddenly you go somewhere else and you, you spend about five times as much time time walking around trying to find where different things are because the flow doesn't make any sense to you it reminds me of a great example if you go to i don't know if all dan murphy's do this but at my local dan murphy's the the, the guy in charge of the wine section just takes a little bit of time each week just to write a little handwritten note mm. sticks it on some of the wine and you think if somebody's taken the time to put some thought into why this is a good product what it might uh, be paired well with then that, that that's a good sort of wayfinding uh, for us and also just putting those things in places that make sense I remember once sort of semi having an argument with uh, a supermarket employee about why the maple syrup wasn't in a certain uh, section and it and, and the, the the reasoning behind it just made no sense and I, I can't imagine that I was the only person that spent 10 minutes looking for maple syrup in that supermarket we've been thinking it would definitely be in this section and walking up and down for five or six minutes before eventually having to go and find a staff member um brian are you uh, uh do you think that any of the things that you've spoken about like those benchmarks and those guides and that advice etc uh, do you think any of it's different between locations say large shopping centers versus maybe more suburban located or even metro versus versus rural is there anything uh, to note or to keep in mind on any of those fronts or is it more of a case that look these are good rules they're good benchmarks it's good advice it's applicable throughout no matter where you are i think there's always great question there's always nuances and there are some nuances between metro and regional of course but then the relativity and ratio is about the same um, but as, as general benchmarks, when we have a full set of pharmacy benchmarks in all sorts of different locations, which happy to, you know, be contacted and talk through, um, the, the general principle is fairly consistent. And the other thing I was going to mention to you too is that a lot of shopping is very habitual. You know, we see great data that comes out that says, you know, 45 to 50% of all commodity retail and, and general grocery retail, for example, is habitual and we think about the amount of times we you know we've changed our favorite toothpaste in the last six months <laughs> it's very habitual and good pharmacists have good data good crm customer relationship management that they're keeping data they're looking at their sales trends they're seeing hey, this is interesting and so much of that data almost gets them to be quite predictive in buying ranges so it's always this question of how i join the dots that makes a great pharmacist 
And yeah. you saw that that range of sales per square meter will push out by, you know, 30, 30 to 70% in terms of its width. And the good ones are really driving that space. Mm. I think it's an interesting comment around habitual purchases because uh, most of the time my wife will go and do the grocery shopping. Uh, when, when I go, she writes a list and it always confuses me. We, like, we buy 95% of the same things week in, week out. I'm like, why don't we just have it on a spreadsheet that I can print out? So I think yeah, you make a right. good point about habitual purchases. Um, yeah. Last one before I let you and the delegates go. Um, sure. what, what sort of macro or, or meta, I'm not even sure that's the, the, the right phrasing, but, but the big overall trends that you're seeing uh, in retail in general, so not just pharmacy, but retail in general. What are some of the big things that people need to be aware of and keep in mind? Um, well, yeah, there's, it's a great question. So the things that have been keeping retailers awake at night has been stock supply, largely. People supply, getting great staff through this period, rising costs of living uh, and inflationary pressures. They're kind of the four big key pieces that we're involved with and see a lot of. And today's uh, discussion was very, very operational because taking the, those sort of macro trends into play, people will be very focused on what they spend for a period of time. And so understanding the value of the transaction and being able to influence that is very important in response. I think that the other thing that's, of course, you know, we'd have to say is the ongoing digitalization the ongoing growth of online, that's also a very big part of, you know, retail generally. And retail in Australia is about a $375 billion business. And through COVID, on average, online product went from about 10% of sales as an average to about 20%. And we talk when we're talking to our clients about omni-channel growth and the importance of having a good physical environment and I'm talking very generally here, of course, and the online supporting channels. So it's very important, for example, that every pharmacy has a website. It doesn't always have to be fully trading and functional yet, but certainly at least has locational sites. And so the ability of pharmacists and retailers in the pharmacy retail to be thinking in that way around this um, omni-channel customer is important as well. Brian, some uh, great points. I um, really enjoyed that chat. Um, I'm just going to grab this, the the screen off you now. Please do. Just Please to do. just to share this with others. So it's only one slide, but we'll we'll go with, we'll go with that. Sure. Um, yeah. So look, Brad Brook, uh, or sorry, Brook didn't join us in the end, but uh, Brad, Alexander, and of course you, Brian, on behalf of the delegates in the guild. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, great presentations, uh, very insightful. Uh, for all those people that have logged on, the attendees, the Guild has some great resources to help support your pharmacy business. So please head to the Guild website, guild.org.au. And of course, the, the websites and the links that all of our presenters have shared with you tonight. A reminder that the recording of this session, uh, it'll be available shortly on the Guild's YouTube channel. And of course, I'd encourage you all, as I mentioned earlier, to check out our podcast series. So the PBCN, the Pharmacy Business and Career Network podcast, uh, look, it features a range of industry experts sharing their experiences working in pharmacies and the broader health sector across Australia and even people like Brian and, and others who work in and around supporting pharmacies and help with their success. We've got more than 100 episodes that you can go and have a listen to. Uh, it's full of stories to help uh, you not only understand more about the world of pharmacy business management, but, but also really get some insights into the patients that you meet and, and care for throughout your pharmacy career. We're always keen to hear more from our listeners about topics that you would like us to cover uh, and from anybody that you know has an interesting story to tell in the field. So please visit our podcast page at guild.org.au forward slash podcast uh, and get in touch with your ideas. People, that wraps it up. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Daniel.